साधु 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 अहम बंते तिसरनेन सह पंचशीलानि याचामि दुतियंपि अहम बंते तिसरनेन सह पंचशीलानि याचामि तत्यंपि अहम बंते तिसरनेन सह पंचशीलानि याचामि नमो तस भगवतो अरहतो समा संबुधस 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 नमो तस भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस नमो तस भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि तंगं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि संघं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि संघं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि संघं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपि संघं सरनं गच्छामि ते सरनगमनं नितितं आमा बंधे अनाति पाता वेरमनिसिकापदं समाधिया आनाति पाता वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि अदिन्नादाना मनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि अदिन्नादाना वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि कामे सुमिचाचारा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि आमे सुमिच्छा चारा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरामेरया मंजा पमादक थाना वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि रामेरे मध्य पमादत्थाना वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि इमानि पंच सिखा पदानि सीले न सुगतिंगन्ति सीले न भोग संपदा सीले न निपतिंगन्ति तस्मा सीलं सोदाये साधु 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 Sat, 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 Sat. 147, Chula Ra, Rahula Bodha Sutta, the shorter discourse of advice to Rahula. Thus have I heard on, on occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's part. Note 13.23. M.A. says that this discourse was spoken to Rahula Sort after his higher ordination, presumably at the age of 20. The sutta also occurs at SN 35, 127. 
Then, while the blessed one was alone in meditation, a thought arose in his mind. Thus, the states that ripen in deliverance have ripened in Raula. Not one, three, two, four. Vimutti paripa chaniya dhamma. MA interprets the, this as the 15 quality that purify the five faculties faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, namely, in regard to each faculty, avoiding people who lack the faculty, associating with those endowed with it, and reflecting on suttas that inspire its maturation. MA bring in another set of 15 qualities, the five faculties again, the five perception, partaking of penetration, namely, perception of impermanence, suffering and no self, abandoning and dispassion, and the five quality, thought the Megiya, namely, noble friendship, the virtue of the monastic rule, suitable conversation, energy and wisdom, end of notes. Suppose I were to lead him on future to the destruction of the taints. Then, when it was morning, the blessed one dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savatti for arms. When he had walked for arm in Savatti and had returned from his arm round, after his meal, he addressed the venerable Raula thus. Take your sitting cloth with you, Raula. Let us go to the blind man's grove to pass the day. Yes, venerable sir, the venerable Rahula replied, and taking his sitting cloth with him, he followed close behind the Blessed One. Now, on that occasion, many thousands of deities followed the Blessed One, thinking, Today the Blessed One will lead the venerable Rahula further to the destruction of the chains. Note 1325 Emi says that these deities who came from various celestial realms had been companions of Rahula's during the previous life in which he first made the aspiration to attain arahanship as the son of a Buddha. Then the Blessed One went into the blind man's grove and sat down at the root of a certain tree on a seat made ready, and the Venerable Rahula paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. The Blessed One then said to the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, what do you think? Is the eye permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself, no venerable sir. Rahula, what do you think? Our forms, etc., is eye consciousness, etc., is eye contact, etc., is anything comprised within the feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness? that arise with eye contact as condition, permanent or impermanent. Note 1326. It should be noted that the last four items mentioned are the four mental aggregates. Thus, this discourse covers not only the sense bases, but also the five aggregates, the aggregate of material form being implied by the physical sense of faculties and their objects. End of note. Impermanent, Venerable Sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness. Suffering, Venerable Sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Rahula, what do you think? Is the ear permanent or impermanent? Is the nose permanent or impermanent? Is the tongue permanent or impermanent? Is the body permanent or impermanent? Is the mind permanent or impermanent? 
Our mind objects is mind consciousness, is mind contact, is anything comprised within the feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness that arise with the mind contact as condition permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. Seeing thus, Rahula, a well taught the noble disciple, becomes disenchanted with the eye, disenchanted with forms, disenchanted with eye consciousness, disenchanted with eye contact, and disenchanted with anything comprised within the feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness that arise with eye contact as condition. Becomes disenchanted with the ear. He becomes disenchanted with the nose, he becomes disenchanted with the tongue, he becomes disenchanted with the body, he becomes disenchanted with the mind, disenchanted with mind object, disenchanted with mind consciousness, disenchanted with mind contact, and disenchanted with anything comprised with the feeling, perceptions, formations and consciousness that arise with mind contact as condition. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated, he understands. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Rahula was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken, through not clinging, the Venerable Rahula's mind was liberated from the taints. And in those many thousands of deities, there arose the spotless, immaculate, immaculate vision of the Dhamma. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. Note 1327, according to M.A., dream entry was the minimal attainment of those deities, but some attained the higher paths and fruits up to our handship. End note. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Auntie, just a quick question. Um, when when it is to talk about uh, this is myself, Shouldn't it be a capital uh, S with myself because it says Atta or is it still correct? Self isn't really a word that we normally capitalize. I know in the old text, the old English translation, they would capitalize it, but they had kind of an agenda in doing so. They were trying to say that there is a self, it's just the lower case self. So, And there was, there's criticism, rightly so, I think, about, about these scholars who were trying to argue that there was that the buddha didn't didn't dismiss the existence of the self just the, the capital s self but in english it's not a word that we normally capitalize not like german about being disenchanted does does that mean that one does not cling he says uh, he becomes disenchanted with the nose so one does not cling with everything nibida. disenchanted is nibida it's the Having enough, getting tired of it, the incessant arising and ceasing, the instability, the unpredictability, and you just realize it's just not worth it. You just feel, get this sense of dispassion. Uh, before we read the note about how one becomes the son of a Buddha, before that, I was just thinking about that, like how, how. I mean, it must it must be such a good karma to become the son of a of a Buddha. Actually, like that's that seems also pretty high um, something. Well, he has a lot of history with the Buddha, the past lives. You can read about the past lives, and he was quite often a son or somehow closely related to the Buddha. During the time of uh, Buddha Padumuttara, both uh, 
Rahula and Rattapala were like uh, rich householders and then they did uh, some really good deeds and they were born in one was born as the Sakka, the other one was uh, Rahul was born as a Naga king and then they I think uh, offered uh, arms to the Buddha Padabutra and made a wish uh, at the presence of the Buddha and uh, the Buddha gave the blessings. So this was the beginning. Uh, there's a long story Thank about you. it. Yeah, I was curious about that story. Thank you so much for telling. Yeah, I shared the link. It contains the entire story. In uh, content, it's very familiar. I mean, it's, it's almost verbatim stuff that mm-hmm. we've read before and uh, stuff that is in many different places almost exactly the same. But the, there's one in, interesting detail just as a remark because I don't know how common it is for both the senses and the aggregates to be mentioned. And so he makes a note of it. I don't know. I mean, my guess is it certainly could be phrased in this way elsewhere, but usually you have either the five aggregates or the six senses, and the implication is that it includes the other, but here he's making the direct connection, which makes this valuable to remind us of that connection. I mentioned it last week, that normally he would use the, or originally to the five ascetics, he talked about him non-self in terms of the five aggregates. But here he switches to the six senses, and the, in the last sutta it was the six senses. But here also he makes the mention of the five aggregates, meaning making clear that that they're they're basically a part of the same thing. You can't really have you can't have one without the other. I wanted to continue the question of uh, edit because um, as, as I remember, I don't know if I remember correctly every. Uh, bodhisattva that becomes a Buddha in the past, they do a determination, and even the first di- di- disciples, they do a determination, and now we see that the son does a determination as well. Is that like a rule for every Buddha and the very close uh, people that interact with Buddha, they did a determination previously? I think that's the implication. It's just, it's very. It shows how powerful it can be. But it's related to some. It's always related to some noble deed they did. Usually, some gift of charity, so something mundane but impressive with great sincerity, because it lends confidence and weight to your determination. But Bante, it's not the act that's important, right? It's it's the mind that um, has this intention with 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 that. Right, but the act is the act empowers the intention. You can't just sit alone one day and decide on these things. You have to do something great associated with it. Mm-hmm. The blessedness yeah, also gives it probably a lot of power. If you know oh, he approved of it, then you, it gives it way more weight. Yes, that determination is done in front of a Buddha. You want to be, be the wife of the Bodhisattva. It is the same. And you uh, and the person who makes the determination keeps following the bodhisattva. For example, uh, Princess Yashodara was the wife of the bodhisattva for many, many lives. So one interesting uh, note is that uh, the ordination of uh, Prince Rahula was the beginning of the Samanera ordination. Before that, it was just Upasampada, direct Upasampada. What exactly is the purpose of the Samanera? Is it to have it easier on younger people? Yeah, Samanera ordination is like uh, 10 precepts. You don't keep the whole entire Upasapada precepts. Yeah, in, in nature it's conceived of as the leaving home. You can only become a, a bhikkhu if you've left home already. So there's the formal going forth. It's like an, the, the ideal of what someone who has left home should be like before they enter into the order, which has a lot of rules for harmony and propriety and that sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of sort of proactive rules 
that monks keep, but the Samanera is the shell, the the vehicle of one who has gone forth. It's, it's expected that if any non-Buddhists don't keep the ten precepts, they're not really, they haven't really left the household life, even though they might live in the forest or whatever. The Vimuti Paripachanya Dhammas, but they are, I mean, there are 15 qualities. I don't think I heard this list. I can understand the first five, the five faculties. But what are the others? Basically, the ten others, other ones. Uh, he tells you what they are. I think it's mentioned in the Chulara Holavada Sutta one, the commentary. Not associating a person without faith, who, ha- who doesn't have faith. Wow, not associating with anyone who doesn't have the same faith like we do, right? Yeah, that's no, the first one. Not associating with someone who doesn't have the faculty of confidence, someone who is wavering, who is doubting, who is unsure of themselves, doubting everything, questioning all the time, skeptical, that sort of thing. Yeah, because unless you are Sotapanna, or higher, doubt can be infectious. Like you associate it with people, a lot of people who are doubting all the time, and you start to think the same way if you keep uh, conversing with them. The same with not, not associating with lazy, lazy people and not associating with uh, mad people or mentally old people, and not associating with people who are. Who the shaky mind, I think. The first thing the Buddha says in, in the discourse on blessings, the highest blessings, the first one is not associating with foolish people and associating with the wise. Big deal. Um, I do, I do have naturally this inclination, but I thought it's it's wrong. I thought, I thought the. Uh, that I should force myself to bear with them, actually. So that's wrong? No, associating here means associating as a friend. If you are in the position of a teacher, that's different. You are giving advice. You are being the example. No, no. I, I mean, you know, lay life will put you in, in, a, in a group. Yeah, who he's not talking about could... lay life, first of all. He's talking about uh, okay. monastic life. But um, that makes it a lot clearer because it's everything. Everything is more messy as a lay person, but still wise advice, even for lay people. You just have to understand the limitations. But that feeling of not wanting to be surrounded by these people is not unwholesome. Uh, I mean, I I feel like it's well, that there not, is. So. Don't don't put words in his mouth. That's not what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. He's, that's okay. not that feeling that he's talking about. That feeling is unwholesome. Okay. So that makes it 15. Uh, 5 into 3. Each of, the, each of the 5 has 3 ways of doing it. That's the first 15. There's another 15. Uh, in, uh, in regards to the second list, of 15, uh, he's abandoning uh, basically restraint from sensuality and stuff like that, keeping the precept. No, abandoning is in terms of letting go. I thought I thought that's kind of like almost the same with dispassion then. Well, dispassion leads to abandonment, right? Once you don't have any passion anymore. Okay, yeah, he misses something. Um, it's not that consequential, but the commentary doesn't just say impermanent suffering and non-self. It says perception of impermanence. Perception of suffering in impermanence. Yes, perception of non-self in suffering. I can't find it again. I'm just trying to find the perception of suffering in impermanence, the perception, in, mm-hmm. perception of non-self in suffering. And then Pahana Sanya Viraga Sanya Ima Pancha Nibeda Bhagya Sanya Megya Terasa Katita Kalyanami. 
So, I mean, these faculties have to be ready for anyone, right? Like, it's not only that Rahula had to be ready, but anyone who would intend to achieve or uh, the Sotapanna even, you have you have to have these faculties. Yes. Well, we ha- all have these faculties. It's just they aren't ripened. There isn't a strength to them. The mind isn't strong and becomes strengthened as these faculties come together. Well, the mind, as the mind becomes a strength, and you can describe the mind in terms of these faculties as being strong. It's a way of describing the mind that has been strengthened through mindfulness, through practice. If one is only practicing vipassana, is there a, are there faculties all going up together, like their strength, their level of, or is it still wisdom? I imagine wisdom is the, because it's the most important one, is, has to be the strongest. Um, so is, is it more developed? Well, that, that's why I said it like I did. It's not like there's a gas tank or a dipstick that you can dip in and see, oh, my my strength is at the, my my wisdom is at this level and my confidence is at that level and this one is strong and that one is strong. They're just ways of describing the mind that is strengthened, the mind that is well trained. That's why we talk about in terms of balance, because you'll notice if, if there's a if there's still weaknesses based on a lack of one of the faculties or a, an imbalance or something, but you can't uh- really measure them. As things, as entities, or something. But to, but to me, it sounds like the um, insights are leading up to uh, these all this to come together. Actually, well, they're not exactly insights. Again, that that word I don't think uh, translation. As you see more clearly, I mean that's wisdom, right? As you see more clearly, your mind becomes more strengthened. There's of course more confidence more focus, more effort. I, I was thinking of the 16 stages of insight, Mante. Well, insight is not the right word. Yeah, Thank but you. it's the only one yeah. I know. Yeah, no, you're, no I, I'm, yeah, I don't mean to criticize, but uh, more stages of clarity. The, the, uh, and maybe being a nitpick, because the Buddha does use the word uh, jnana, right? knowledge. It just reminds me of the relay chariot uh, where I don't know which sutta he talks about the insights where uh, it's described like relay chariots when you're going that was no. MN24 Rata Vinita Sutta thank you Bant. but it's still not like I just meant to say that um, rather than thinking them as insights thinking them as uh, stages of clarity just mm-hmm. to, to get away from this idea that it's somehow concepts or ideas that you get, like oh, you get this idea of something in your mind. It's more intellectual, not really that kind of thing. It's more of a perspective or clarity, really, uh-huh. knowledge in terms of how you see it. You 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 realize or you see the, for example, nibida. If you experience nibida, right, it's not a thought that you have. It's it's just a sense, a clarity that you didn't have before, like. It's like an opening of your eyes, and it's a appreciation. And these things are just incessant and uninteresting, unexciting. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, which kind of knowledge is uh, when uh, when you know that your mind is liberated? Is an experiential an experiential knowledge? Because here in paragraph ten, um, it seems that uh, the Buddha talk about. Um, the whole path. So you need to be disenchanted because before you become dispassionate. And then it seems that uh, you come into a point where you, this knowledge arise. So this knowledge is an experience. It's, from what I understand, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, again, knowledge is, it's, it's a word the Buddha uses, but you have to think of knowledge in terms of a certainty or a clarity or a direct vision as opposed to an intellectual idea. It's not because you have this experience, then you want, well, of course, then you understand that this is what happened to you. 
and you are sure that you will not uh, reborn again. Well, for an arahant, those those sorts of certainties arise, but uh, the insight is just the the experience of it. It's just the experience of of purity, freedom, freedom from defilement. That's what, like, that's what's meant by knowledge. It's just that we think of knowledge in the West and in modern times more of as a, an intellectual knowledge, like a, an idea that arises in your mind. But you, when you know, so when you experience something, you know it in a way that's not really intellectual, not a knowing in the way we use that word. Well, we also use the word, but yeah, you have to distinguish knowing in terms of being sure and knowing in terms of thinking thinking it or having an idea, having a thought. Also, you know, it is, impossi- it is possible that uh, we have that knowledge um, when we meditate or during meditation throughout our life, not necessarily, not necessarily have this kind of experience, because from what I understand, this one is the knowledge of uh, the first glimpse of Nibbana when you, when you become a Sotapana. So it is possible for us uh, that we are not reaching that state to have that kind of knowledge. It's possible for you to have intellectual knowledge, but not the knowledge the Buddha is talking about. Mm. You can you can think to yourself, oh yeah, this is not worth clinging to, which is valuable, but not the same sort of knowledge. It's not an Thank idea you, that arises in the mind, oh, nothing is worth clinging to. It's just a sort of perspective uh, appreciation or a, I say there's no other good word and knowledge there's the knowledge like you just know you, mm-hmm. you just know it I mean it's not an idea that arises in your mind or a belief or something it's just you're just experiencing it yeah these things are not worth clinging to it's not a thought like that it's mm-hmm. just the way you look at them based on the clarity 73 mundane and super mundane knowledge is uh, described in Buddhism. And out of those 73, except for six, uh, uh, an arahant can attain the rest. So 67 out of 73 can be attained by an arahant. It seems that... <clears throat> Uh, because because it's so similar to to other suttas, like I think even uh, Venerable Sariputta was asking similar questions to um, Venerable Channa in regards to the eye consciousness and things like that. So the senses, basically. So was this common that they questioned uh, each other about? Um, these things and maybe they hear heard the answers and sometimes like even Rahula now while he isn't uh, yet an arahant or uh, he still can answer the questions well what you prob- what you can probably notice uh, if you look is that uh, these are the sorts of questions and conversations uh, relating to people who were spiritually mature, so it's not a introductory teaching. Mm-hmm. Absolutely these not. Questions to people who are, who are ready to answer them. So it may be that these people had heard these teachings before, but they weren't ready to appreciate them. Of course, the Buddha is the only one who knows that uh, now is the time where if I ask them again these questions, or if I if I ask these questions now. It will have meaning. It's also a form of reporting. Like it's how oh, yeah. interviews. An example of how this question and answer is an important part of Buddhism. Yeah. So when when would the teacher would ask this question, one, I mean, you have to think about it, but also just check uh how you see it, right? I I, th- I still think it's there is mindfulness here in uh, before the answers. Said so that there is no sermon without meditation. Every sermon given by the Buddha is you know, some kind of meditation. 
I mean, Bante, when uh, we talked about how the Buddha's word would enlighten other people, it's not that. It's like you, you, uh, you, you're meditating then, right? Yeah. It's, I don't think it's quite a guided meditation. It doesn't have to be quite a guided meditation, though when the Buddha yeah. gave talks, it would, it would often be a sort of guided meditation, or it be, the monks would be sitting listening very mindful and meditative. But it can also trigger a uh, fruit of previous meditation. So you suppose Rahula was meditating the whole morning or the night before or something, and then all it takes is the next day to have this discussion with the Buddha to trigger meditative state. As far as how you you look at these um, conversations, it, you don't have to try and make them into meditations when, for example, say if you go to report with your teacher, right? of course, always you should be mindful, no question, but the value can often be just in untying a knot kind of thing that allows the fruit of your previous meditation to shine through. So it's not, it doesn't have to be, it's not the only way you get value out of conversations, for example is to be meditating during the time that you you hear them or you engage in them. But of course you should always try to be vigilant about mindfulness. Take the the first questions we ask the meditators, right? The first day, second day. There's, uh, especially the second day, the questions are not just to elicit answers, they're also to facilitate the change in perspective to show you the way we want you to the way we want you to look at things because mm -hmm. the questions kind of are are a bit foreign they're not what you expect the teacher to ask you not if you're thinking in terms of people places things concepts you're starting to be asked about aggregates and about mind and experience and so there's a conditioning that goes along with the questions and it directs the person the listener's mind or the, the person being asked directs their mind that adjusts their mind in a certain way like if we start talking now let's start talking about the five aggregates and just as the buddha does rahula and we'll see that as we start to resonate with these things it will, i mean it, it, it recalls back previous practices and it evokes mm -hmm. states of mindfulness changes your perspective you start to talk about sitting posture and you talk about the senses seeing hearing smelling tasting feeling thinking if you've been meditating in the past not just at that moment really at that moment is not the most important thing but that you've been practicing then you're able to resonate with what's being said i was wondering if being happy for somebody's suffering is always bad? Or is it okay to be happy if somebody does a deed deed and we know they will be punished by karma? Well, being happy is never bad, but liking something is pretty much always bad. But bad is relative. I mean, liking the fact that someone is suffering is not a, it's not a great look. It's the opposite of karma, cruelty. Like you're preferring somebody's suffering. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess that my question would be, is karma a good thing or is it just a neutral law of the universe? A good thing. Uh, no, it's a bad thing. It'd be great if there were not consequences to our actions. I, I guess that's a bit tongue-in-cheek because if there were not consequences to our actions, there would also not be consequences to good actions. I mean, it just would make no sense. It's a ridiculous kind of thing to postulate I would say for me at least it's more the opposite because uh, as an example King Ajatasattu is now in hell and suffering for a very long time and he had the chance to become a Sotapanna so if you do something bad you you are the one who has to suffer from yeah, the I mean, for a long time most commonly this kind of attitude that was mentioned comes from when you're the, the victim right 
if you do bad things to me, oh, I'm, I'm happy when you receive. I mean, that's the most simplistic example. But it can also be when we, like when you uh, hear a story or when you read about all the evil deeds that someone has done and you just get angry about it. So it really comes from a place of anger, a relief of anger to have the the object of your anger be destroyed, be erased, like their fortune, someone's good, someone's happiness, someone's success. And you see them losing all of that you, because you were angry at it. You were angry at that success. And then the, the success is gone. You're like, good. I'm glad. I feel happy because of the anger towards that thing. You were able to, it was, it, it was destroyed. It went away. Actually, if you're thinking in terms of karma, it's uh, the fourth Brahma Hara, Pekka. Yeah, it doesn't involve happiness. Being happy about somebody's suffering. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, we the way we use that word is we mean liking it, but there's nothing wrong technically with being happy. And the Buddha smiled when he saw people suffering, so there was happiness there, right? This is it's uh, that's a somana sajita, right? Asitupada jitta. Yeah, asitupada jitta. Yes. So the Buddha was happy to see a lot of. Them. Buddha was often happy when people suffered, but it didn't mean he it didn't mean he liked it. It was more just a, well, it was a rem, uh, remarking on the uh, strangeness and on the, the freedom. It was that it, it's not it's not so much a deliberate happiness as it is a happiness that comes from being free, not not having to experience that suffering. Moggallana also smiled, right? The happiness, the involuntary sort of happiness. Yeah, but that is usually. I mean, Arahants are safe because they, are, they have Kiriya Chittas as mere mortals <laughs> trying to be happy that other people suffering is not very dangerous. Yeah, it's a different, but it's a, it's a different way of being happy. It's not related to liking it. This is why we, we have trouble with this because we use this these words interchangeable. I'm happy for you means I like it. Right? But just being happy is... Uh, is innocent. It's related to really appreciation of, of one's own freedom uh, and, and also just the, the craziness of samsara. When you see people suffering horribly, I mean, for us, that's just horrific. We say, oh, wow. I, I hope that doesn't happen to me. For Narahan, there's no such fears and no such worries. There's just like the ob observing from us an outsider and more profoundly, an understanding that it's meaningless. This person suffering horribly isn't really tra a tragic thing. It's just the craziness of samsara, and in fact, it's their own doing. They are suffer. They are crazy. That's why they're suffering. I mean, it's it just sounds yeah. so awful to think that the Buddha smiled at these things, but their way of looking is just so profound that they just see it as samsara. They don't. They're they're not worried about what you think of them. If you criticize them, hey, why are you smiling? They don't care. They'll just look at you the same way and say, oh, look at this person, also crazy, also stuck in samsara. And they don't like it. It's not liking. It sounds like they're gleeful and they're happy to see. Laha, look at these people in samsara. They're just happy. So this is the mental present uh, way they are. Nothing to do with liking. Well, okay, it, I mean, it, is, it does occur. With, it does occur with liking. So manasa can be in the same jitta as liking, of course, but it doesn't have yeah, to be. Cool. In this case, it's not. Uh, isn't it uh, about the smiling of the Buddha? Wasn't like a kind of re reaction that would generate an. A question from somebody around, and then the Buddha would explain what was that about. I mean, was there another kind of reaction that would uh, create that effect? Um, well, it's 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 not the person asking that caused it, right? I mean, I'm not sure why you're how you're phrasing it. This is just an odd way to phrase it. So, or I'm, I mean, it's just my misunderstanding. I'm not criticizing. It's just my lack of understanding of what you're trying to say but the explanation has nothing to do with it it's the buddha would 
smile when he saw certain things. Yes, that's what I meant, that um, when something interesting occurred, Buddha would smile and then somebody would ask, why does Buddha smile? But the asking is not necessary. I mean, it may have, we don't, we don't know, it may have, it most likely happened many times without anyone asking. I, I, maybe what you're getting, I wonder if what you're getting at is that why he smiled so that someone would ask about it? I don't know. Um, I mean, that, I don't know if that is what you're saying, but that is an interesting idea. I'm skeptical. I don't think that's the case. I also see that, like, when we do something bad and then we face consequences, we feel also relieved, you know? Like, I have uh suffered for what I did before and and I don't have the guilt anymore. So it's also good for me facing the consequences in my mind. So also for the other person if I see them facing the consequences it's also learning. It can feel that way for sure. I think that's astute. Yeah yeah you have to be a little bit hesitant to relieve yourself of, of the burden for two reasons. I mean, first, as Sanko was trying to say before I interrupted, that you can't be sure, right, whether you really have. I mean, it's not it's not fair to wash your hands of it and say, ah, there, that's the consequences of my actions. No more consequences are going to come. I mean, that's probably not what you meant, though. But the other, th- the other thing is um, it, it creates this kind of dependency where you're allowing the guilt for as long as you haven't experienced the consequences. And rather than deal with the guilt directly, you're relying upon something like experiencing the consequences to relieve you of that guilt without you doing the work yourself. It's the kind, It's probably similar to how certain ascetics torture themselves on purpose so that they can feel the sense. I mean, it's not... It's not Fair to I, mean, I don't mean to say that what, that's what you were talking about at all, but it's the sort of the similar mind state taken to an extreme where they 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 bring on punishment in order to make themselves feel better. No, I was just reminiscing about uh, some experience which made me feel relieved because uh, it it was more probable that it was a consequence of one of my actions of the guilt that I had. Yeah, I just wouldn't rely on it as all. I mean, it's it's that's fine and valuable to appreciate. I mean, it's valuable to appreciate the consequences of your actions, but don't rely on it to free you from guilt. Guilt is something that you should take at face value and face the guilt. That's the best way. Just look at it and see it, and, and maybe watch it arise and cease. It, it's nothing special. It just comes and goes, like everything else. Vipaka can get to, uh, unless you become an arahant, can get to this life, the next life, or until you end sansara, you don't know, but it uh, can get to. Just because maybe face some consequences for an action you did this life, doesn't mean it, is, it has ended. Yeah, but it still can bring relief and a, right, a sense of rightness. I mean, it, 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 it's not just a relief, I think. It's sometimes a lack of, of getting upset at the consequences. There's a relief that comes from wisdom because you're okay with that. Like, wow, normally I'd be really upset, but I'm okay with this, and I appreciate that this is consequences, and it's right. It's, it's, it's just, and so you're okay. I think that's quite common for people who Maybe it got away with something pretty bad, and then when it catches up with them, they're they're okay with it. They feel they feel the resolution. And it can also, in a mundane sense, be very scary having it hanging over your. Head. Then, when people find out about what you did, for example, you're like, kind of. Rely- but again, you don't want to rely on that. You really shouldn't rely on the consequences to make you free you from the guilt or so on. It's just uh, on a deeper level, you should face the guilt. Which is by meditating, being mindful. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not about making it go away or eradicating it. It's just about dissociating yourself from it, seeing that it's not really you. It's just a 
like a thorn in your side that pokes you again and again. <laughs> if you see it like that, it's like, oh, this is something foreign. This is not something I have to worry about. The Buddha uh, prevented Angulemala from uh, experiencing the results of his actions. So I think it can be a good thing if Buddha did it, right? Buddha not so much prevented. Help him attain uh, freedom from suffering or attain Rahantur. He still had to suffer the consequences of that life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not even the Buddha can change someone's karma. That's impossible, right? Well, technically, technically, not literally, not directly, but the Buddha teaching him to become an Arahant did change his karma, his, not his karma, changed the Vipaka. Yeah, the cut off all the Vipaka, Pajavedani and Aparaparivedani. The Vedos Vipaka, Ahosi. Yeah, some people say that. Apparently, some, some teachers say they turned into uh, Dita Dhammavedani. I think there's a bit of a debate there. Yeah, maybe some Anyways, of them, but that doesn't can't. make sense, does it? Yeah. Can't turn, can't. Them, uh, turn them from one to the other. But yeah. I think that's what was what was argued. So. For example, there, there was a I think farmer or someone who burned a uh, cow alive, and I think he got burned many alive in Sansara because of that. Mm -hmm. Was it a cow or a goat? I don't remember. And there's another story about a woman drowning a dog because of that. She got drowned many times in Sansara and died there. Yeah. So that can only happen once a life. <laughs> if all those uh, uh, drownings comes to this life, it, it's not possible to happen. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's some mechanism by which consequences come to you sooner than before. I mean, it seems to be the case where when people practice meditation, very strange things happen to them, good or bad. But there's kind of like a shortening of the distance, like suddenly things that were very far away suddenly become very close. And strange things happen to people when they do meditation courses during and after the course. Just bizarre and, and more frequent than you would than you can write off as coincidence. I mean, maybe it all is all still just coincidence and we're just this what's this word? Uh, it's a bias. Uh, Formation bias. Confirmation bias, that's it. We yeah, waiting like, for something special to happen, you, and anything that happens we take as special. But we have these examples, like Angulimala, it seems that that's the sort of thing that happened to him, maybe. Um, but we also have other stories about how when someone becomes enlightened, suddenly very, they get killed by a cow or something, by a demon cow. If you think about it, the sansara is so long, how many bad de deeds we must have done in the past so if you like allocate one second of your life to each bad deed you have done in sansar <laughs> it's not possible still to for all of those bad karmas to come into fruition this life even if you become another yeah yeah i i i, I hesitate to look at it like that i know these are you're, you're thinking in terms of technical abhidhamma for example the seven mind moments that lead to seven resultants but it's it's dangerous i think to reify these things in that way like they are they are entities out there waiting to pop like bubbles waiting to pop and that's not accurate it's certainly not accurate because karma is 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 complicated and impossible to understand right but that means something that it's it's not simple it's not billiard balls it's messy. We know that because of the reminder that some karma just serves to support other karma. Some karma serves to weaken other karma or even negate it entirely. Not all karma is, is janaka karma. And so it's more just a force that has had an impact on our life. So the idea that I mean, it sounds silly to think that future life karma could, could be converted into present life karma, but 
if you don't if you stop thinking in terms of them as as bubbles or entities or something or billiard balls uh that maybe there is some mechanism by which the shortening of samsara uh, also compacts the results and brings everything closer like it's it's remarkable how uh after you begin to practice meditation your life does feel a lot more compact like people are thrust away from you or thrust towards you people you maybe knew met once when you were younger suddenly reach out to you and uh, become close because of the change in you met the, because of their interest in meditation for example or for other reasons where suddenly you're thrust towards someone who you would have never come in contact with otherwise there seems to be some kind of power i mean I'm not saying there is but observations show that there is some kind of change or uh, simplification that goes on and more interesting than any than valuable and just from something to remark upon so for me, it happens quite frequently when I am uh, having to do with people. For example, somebody who is angry and who always reacts in a negative way. Uh, you cannot uh, condition as much their way of being. But then when it has consequences, uh, after when that person sees the consequences, like I have experiences personally, then they become more humble. So in that sense, it, it is traumatic for yourself also to having to deal with such people. But when you uh, let it be because you can't do much in these scenarios, uh, there is a relief for uh, the other person also when they see the consequences of their way of being. And also for you, because now their behavior is changing when you just so I wanted to add this. And also in another scenario where people are uh, following bad behavior, for example, drinking, then you cannot condition their way of life. But then you also know this is what it would lead to further. So after that, you know that you, and you see that happening. It's not that you could do much as much as you try because that is the view of the, of, of that person. And then you find relief because maybe they would learn this time by you. So I, I was considering more on this line. That's interesting, yeah. I think there's value to value in that for sure. I mean, I think it's a testament to their wisdom. It's it it seems like a bad uh, reaction. We want to feel sorry for people, we want to pity them, we want to try and fix things for them, right? But look at this person just smiling at this person suffering. Shouldn't they fix their problems? It's a testament to the wisdom. And also it's quite valuable to think, to even just think that someone might smile at suffering. Uh, gives us a depth to it that, that wasn't probably there before in most cases. Where we appreciate that it's not about ending the suffering. It's about ending the cause of suffering. The suffering is really uh, inconsequential. This, I mean, it, it is suffering doesn't cause bad things. Suffering isn't something you have to alleviate. What you have to alleviate is you're you're causing the suffering. Even as you're suffering, you're causing more suffering as you dislike it. So smiling at it is is even a good example, because if you could learn to smile at your own suffering, it wouldn't be suffering anymore. You wouldn't suffer. Right? If you could follow this example of the person who isn't taking it seriously, I mean, that's a big part of it is the not getting upset about it, the not taking it seriously, the, the, the not being phased by it is so powerful. The person who can smile in the face of such things is uh, it's a good person to emulate. But is it not the reason they're smiling because they know they don't have to face what they're facing anymore? Yeah, sort of, but I think it's deeper than that. It's just they have no concern. But they can also, I mean, it's not its not supposed to be directly caused by, but it's related. I mean, it's associated with thoughts of goodwill, wishing for them to be happy. It's a kind smile, let's put it that way. 
You won't see someone suffering and you're kind. You're smiling kindly. I'm happy to help you. I'm happy to alleviate your suffering. Happy to do whatever I can to help. That's something I've never heard of, but I think it's valid. Why, are the, why, why is the Buddha smiling? It's not why he's smiling, but it, it could be a part of it. That, that Or you could see, see it this way might help. Smiling because he's happy to help. So it is said that uh, there are two ways uh, the Buddha smiles. One is called Sita, the other one is called Hasita. Sita means uh, smiling without uh, lips, opening the lips, like smiling with a facial expression. You can say smiling with the eyes. Hasita means uh, revealing the teeth a little bit and smiling, not opening the lips all the way, just a little bit. And the Buddha and never makes a sound. One thing that I kind of don't understand, and I imagine it's because the Buddha was beyond this, and this is kind of where I'm stuck, is like he didn't hold back the smile. He didn't like repress it. Because sometimes I feel that I behave a certain way in lay life to just kind of like um, meet people's expectations. And I... I'm confused a little bit about why the Buddha like didn't do that, like how he was beyond that. Like I know it's because he was enlightened, but like what was the thinking behind that type of thing? Like why didn't he I, hold back the smile? I don't think he was beyond it. I, I think he would refrain from smiling when it was inappropriate. I mean, you won't find him smiling when in, in, in many cases. It was usually when he was alone or just you know, just with Ananda. It was not when it wouldn't be when you see someone fall down and you smile at them, down at them, as as they look up at you for help. You don't smile down at them. That that isn't how it, it would be. The Buddha did behave quite properly and was often very serious and considerate, somber in the face of suffering. I mean, he didn't, he didn't smile every time he saw people suffer. It's usually only on the very remarkable ones. It was So it was more about remarking, it seems to be more about remarking on the craziness of samsara, the, the astonishing nature of how things can progress. Like there was a story of a pig, and uh, the Buddha saw a pig and he smiled. And it was because the pig had been just reborn from the Brahma realm. It was from a Brahma to a pig. Not directly, I think. You have to become a human before you become a pig. But quite quite recently, the pig had been a Brahma. And that's quite remarkable. And so he smiled. It's not tor to torture the pig or anything like that. It's, wow, that's quite remarkable. Scary, in fact, for those of us still stuck in some side. And also, mm -hmm. smiling there doesn't cause suffering to the pig. A pig doesn't even understand it. it yeah. But it is a prelude to a starting point to a Dhamma discussion. But as to what Julie says, um, I mean, to some extent, you're, you have to be, there's a fine line to walk because what you're talking about mostly is people's wrong views and you don't want to encourage their wrong views. So you have to walk a fine line between coddling people in their wrong views or helping them to justify or reaffirming their wrong views. But I mean, it's tricky as a layperson. Of course, you can't go around relieving people of their wrong views. But when you talk about people's expectations, what's behind those is quite often wrong view. People have the expectation that you should do things that are immoral, what we would consider immor immoral and unethical, unwholesome. People have expectations that you should act unwholesomely, like getting sad, for example, getting angry, or getting uh, festive and excited about things, that sort of thing. I, I have a question. Uh, in the middle of the night, around 4 a.m., like there was a little kitten uh, uh, right below my window, and it was just crying really, I don't know, sadly, or like for, for their life, I think. And I feel like this... I I just didn't know what to do. Like, should I rescue them? Like, I see so many videos where people just rescue these animals, but there are just so many. And 
um, I don't I don't know. I felt kind of like crap if not doing anything. Just um, I mean, I did uh, try to send meta and but physically, I mean, I, I'm I can't do a lot for them. But I still, the mind felt like sad for the situation. I mean, it's hard to find a great answer. I, I, my, my thought is uh, you have to find the fine line between taking on a dependency and being kind. I, I would naively suggest you to feed such animals, uh, but not take them in as your own. And they would not also- come around regularly. And just try to feed them as you can, but but have no kind of clinging to it, right? If if you can't feed them one day, you don't feed them one day, and if, if they have hardships, well, that's on them. But you give them some some kindness. Remind me of the two kitten, two cats who follow me around in the street uh, whenever I go out of the house. I used to give them chicken bones or leftover food. I still do whenever I get the chance. I mean, they are not my cats, but uh, they seem hungry. So instead of throwing away leftover food, why don't I give? So just an act of kindness. I mean, I don't take ownership of the cats, but uh, as it happens, I saw them and they looked hungry, so I gave. So there was a question in the chat um, from Milos, but Milos is no longer here. He asks, why isn't happiness along with suffering impermanent? Is happiness not subject to arising as well? What depends what you mean by happiness, which probably isn't clear what the meaning what I mean by that, but um, I'm not sure what you're referring to exactly. The problem with the word happiness and the word suffering is that they can be used in a experiential sense. Are you experiencing a painful feeling or a happy feeling? So in terms of uh, feelings, or they can be used in a philosophical sense in terms of what is good and what is bad, what is satisfying and what is unsatisfying. But uh, happy feelings are impermanent, just as painful feelings are impermanent. But uh, dukkha often refers rather to what is impermanent, whereas sukha refers to what is not impermanent. And so the only real sukha is nibbana, and dukkha is everything else. If someone cultivates a lot of mindfulness during their life, and when they die, is it likely that they make quicker progress because they cultivated it in their past life, and now the condition is better? Yeah, it might be easier. An example is there in the sutta we read today. The devas who listened to the sutta given to Venerable Rahula, they also attended like those devas were with uh, Venerable Rahula in the previous life. Yeah, I mean, many things will be supportive in the next life for sure. Where you're born, who you're born near, who's, who you're associated with will all change as you change. That's a valid, valid thing to look forward to. Of course, looking forward is not great, but that's not terrible. I mean, it can be a source of great confidence. When you feel bad, you can remember, oh, well, a lot of this is just based because of who I used to be. And I just have to bear with it. But many good things are coming once this has all worked out. Yeah, I mean, before I practiced, I... I mean, sometime before I practiced, I still broke the precepts, and I'm sure I wasn't practicing before that in other lives. So there must be a great difference in the next one. Well, I wouldn't, yeah, for sure, for sure. In general, not speaking about you in particular, in general, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that because, Mm. first of all, to get here, you probably did do some very good things in the past. And. Don't underestimate how good you have it now. That uh, though it may seem awful at times, it's actually quite comfortable. And the expectation for for greater ease or comfort or simplicity is 
is uh, yeah probably misleading. Certainly, it can lead obviously to complacency because then when you get what you want, like ah oh, yeah, now I can relax, mm. and then you go slower rather than faster. And my other question was, uh, if a sotapanna or even sakadagami, because they also can be reborn as humans, we know that they have a fortunate rebirth. But can it not still be the case that they have a bad one? Like if they have a human birth, that they still have uh, be born in a bad state? Or there are even devas who still have a low, lower state, like uh, in I mean, comparison to other. It's complicated, but generally, no. Generally, they would be very wealthy and happy and comfortable and powerful and have lots of friends and lots of good things. They would be, wherever they go, welcome and treated well. Generally, I mean, obviously, it's complicated. I mean, Moggallana, was, was, uh, people tried to assassinate him. The Buddha, even, people tried to assassinate the Buddha. It's complicated, but... Generally speaking, the Buddha, uh, Moggallana, they grew up and lived in very pleasant surroundings. So, whatever uh, human birth uh, you, you know, even a sotapanna, whatever hardship you will have or anything, but the fact that you're a human is a wholesome karma. It's a yes, the Lord. Vipaka. It's a wholesome vipaka. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, but yeah, but there's still, there can be still a lot of suffering in the human realm, but yeah, not compared to the very low realms. They are unlikely to come to the human world, but if they come to the human world, it is even more unlikely that they would be born in a unfortunate or a difficult, under difficult circumstances. Yeah, yeah. I also have like a question uh, about like, If if we had such an interest in Buddhism and the practice and so on, like why didn't we, why weren't we born um, closer to the to Thailand and Sri Lanka and such? Like if we truly had that inclination, in the first place. Right. Yeah. I mean, if so, for many people, it might not have been a connection with Buddhism so much as good, a goodness. That allows the connection to be made. So I don't know who who's come in contact with Buddhism in the past, but I know if you're here now, you've got to have some goodness to make it resonate with you. Yeah, so it depends on your birth karma. If you did a karma and channel it towards enlightenment, maybe you are likely to be born closer to where the Dhamma is. But if you just do a very good deed without uh, any particular wish, then you can be born maybe in a very developed country uh, with a lot of comforts. I wanted to ask about the Nagas. Like, are they superior to human beings? And is it possible for a meditator to be born as a Naga? What 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 uh, what are they considered in Buddhism? Animals. They're considered animals. But superior to humans. I mean, the answer is probably no. Except why I say probably is because they tend to have magical powers that surpass most humans, supposedly. And they also have uh, pleasures that are comparable to humans. Uh, what, and how can they be related to meditators, if at all? I mean, they're not really. They can't meditate because they're animals. Okay, so so meditators cannot become nagas. Like, can we have the assurance yeah. that? No, no. Okay. You, could, you could become a naga. You, uh, well, a person who has reached the second stage of knowledge will never will not be reborn in animal kingdom. So, okay, yeah. In the next life, but future life is still possible. Okay, thank you. So the reason why Rahul was born as a Naga king was because uh, this uh, hermit he was uh, taking care of in a distant past life during the before the time of Buddha Padmutra. 
he used to visit the naga realm and then he used to describe the, the beauties and pleasures there then because of this uh, he made a wish that may i be born as a naga king and the other one ratapala uh, in a previous life he wished to be born as a saka because the other hermit uh, used to visit the saka's kingdom and describe uh, the beauty of that there okay they they made some kind of determination because of the attraction they felt towards that world okay yeah yeah thank you for example sak does saka have a, a wife in the tavatinsa heaven do they, do they have wives at all saka has many many names like yeah it's not uh, not wives but his wives were all his wives were all reborn with him except for one who was reborn as a bird oh, she was very he bad. has wives so well, he had wives as a human i think they stay his wives when they migrated to the heavenly realm but i don't know how things work in heaven imagine they have laws and and guidelines just like us probably more profound and complicated and intricate more lofty and heaven like maybe they have marriage but, ceremonies as well so but if we go up upper like uh uh tawating uh no to sita and uh the others there is no such things right uh, i'm not sure i think yeah probably i think less and less i can't remember but yeah i think it's less sexual well, in those high ones if if the if the mara has three daughters i i would imagine it goes all the way up <laughs> well, daughters of mara may be metaphorical I mean, it's not to say that three three celestial beings didn't come to him. I wasn't there. I don't know, but uh, to say that they were technically daughters, like he got a woman pregnant, got a female they were pregnant, or or whatever, or he himself gave birth to Mara, gave birth to them, or something like that, is well, we don't know. And I wouldn't put any wager on either way. A born spontaneously. Yeah, so devas. Devas, yeah, devas can't uh, can't be pregnant, right? Don't think so. Anyway, thank you for entertaining. Okay, well that's all for me this week. Thank you all for coming. Sadhu. 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 Sadh